Um, first, I want to welcome everyone to the Microsoft Innovation and Policy Center. Uh, my name is Charlie Salem. I'm the Managing Director for Policy here in the DC office. And we're thrilled to be uh, hosting this event with, uh, with ACS. Uh, and I know we've got a packed schedule, so we're going to just dive right in. I'm going to introduce uh, Caroline Fredrickson, uh, someone I've known since she was uh, Deputy Chief of Staff with uh, Senator Daschle, who's the Majority Leader. Uh, and since then, she's gone on to do a number of, uh, a number of important things. She's been a Senate uh, Chief of Staff from Maria Cantwell. Uh, she worked in the White House Office of Legislative Affairs. Uh, she uh, has been a, an advocate for NARAL and the ACLU. And I think to a lot of us in this room, to me in, in particular, she's been a trusted advisor and, a, and, a, and an expert on a, a number of legal issues and civil rights issues. So it's my uh, real pleasure to bring up uh, Carolyn Fredrickson. I'd like to thank you, and I, uh, I could run through all of your tremendous attributes, um, uh, but it would take us much longer than the time we have um, here today. But suffice to say that Charlie has been a, a terrific leader in the progressive community in D.C. and was certainly somebody I worked with closely on the Hill. Um, so I'm Caroline Fredrickson. I'm the president of the American Constitution Society. Um, and in addition to thanking Charlie, I'd like to thank Microsoft um, for hosting this event today and for the company's enduring commitment to promoting equality before the law, especially in the area of LGBT rights. And if anyone in the room is not familiar with ACS, well, you should be, and I hope you will uh, soon become more familiar. Um, but we are a network of lawyers, law professors, law students, policymakers, and judges who believe that the law should be a force to improve the lives of all people. We work for positive change by shaping the debate on vitally important legal and constitutional questions. And our mission is to ensure that the fundamental principles of human dignity, individual rights and liberties, enjoy their rightful, central place in American law. Many view the fight for LGBT equality as one of our generation's most pressing and important national struggles. And ACS has been deeply involved in bringing the realities of discrimination and inequality affecting the LGBT community to the national dialogue. We continue this work with our focus on marriage equality. With the looming and historic Supreme Court cases, various state marriage equality initiatives at play, and our president and his administration now supporting equal rights for same-sex couples, marriage equality is front and center in our national legal and political debate. So I will now turn it over to my dear colleague um, to discuss a little bit more about today's topic, Deepal Shah, who's the director at ACS of Policy Development and Programming for LGBT Issues. Good afternoon. My husband and I married a year ago in the District of Columbia. This past weekend, as any responsible citizens would, we started preparing our taxes. After some research, it turns out that we are required to prepare three returns and file a mock fourth. After six hours of work, we're still just starting. All this due to the state and federal legal disconnect attached to our marriage. Let me clarify that this experience is likely the least oppressive of realities facing same-sex couples due to the nation's current patchwork of laws. Gays and lesbians in various states, including next door in Virginia, are denied the right to enter into certain joint contracts, to share in the same rights of adoption as their straight neighbors, and lack equal treatment with respect to powers of attorney, estate and inheritance laws, and health care rights. The second class treatment is compounded by federal law, which mandates disparate treatment in the arena of immigration, federal taxation, and social security benefits for same-sex couples. And there are just, these are just a few of the distinctions in treatment. According to the U.S. Government Accountability Office, there are over 1,000 federal laws under which benefits, rights, and privileges are contingent on marriage or under which marital status is a factor. More than 1,000. The point here is the absence of marriage equality on both the state and national level stings on a daily basis. All of this despite the equality of love, commitment, and support shared between those impacted. These realities, however, may soon change. As we will discuss in today's program, in just a matter of weeks, the Supreme Court will hear two very important cases, Hollingsworth v. Perry and U.S. v. Windsor, 
which may resolve the question of whether same-sex couples in the United States should and will have the right to marry. Some believe these cases could result in the end to both California's Proposition 8 and the Defense of Marriage Act, and perhaps sweeping national marriage rights for same-sex couples. Others, however, believe that the court could arrive at extremely narrow conclusions or perhaps reject marriage equality outright. Embedded in these cases are extremely important questions relating to standing and scrutiny. Indeed, these more doctrinal and procedural elements may hold the key to fundamental fairness and equality before the law. They may also have a broader impact on future cases involving LGBT people before the court as well as Supreme Court litigation more generally. Now the panelists of our thought-provoking discussion. I'm pleased to introduce Walter Dellinger, partner at O'Melveny and Myers LLP and former acting U.S. Solicitor General. Suzanne Goldberg, Herbert and Doris Wexler, clinical professor of law and director of, of the Center for Gender and Sexuality Law at Columbia Law School. And Paul Smith, partner at Jenner and Block, ACS board member, and lead counsel in the groundbreaking Supreme Court case, Lawrence v. Texas. I will now turn things over to our experts, who I'm sure you'd rather hear from, that's why you're here today, to discuss these very important issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deepal, and we are all delighted to be here today to talk with you and what will be Consider this as though we are joining you for lunch, even though we're not eating, and we're having a sort of casual lunch conversation that we will hold for about 45, 50 minutes, and then invite you all to come in with questions after that. Uh, and the aim is to, in our casual lunchtime conversation among the three of us, to cover four topics. First, the question, can the court even hear these two marriage cases that it is slated to have argument in two weeks? Uh, second, if it does get to the merits of the case, the cases, or either of the cases, what standard of review ought to be applied to the sexual orientation-based classification that's drawn to, by Proposition 8 in California, which took away marriage rights from same-sex couples, and by the Defense of Marriage Act, which blocks the U.S. government from recognizing same-sex couples' marriages? Third, Regardless of the standard of review, what do we make of the rationales for either of these measures? What really could justify refu government's refusals to recognize same-sex couples' marriages? And finally, we'll step back and have a little conversation about climate change, not the weather, but with respect to uh, GLBT rights, gay and lesbian rights in particular. Uh, but to just to, to pause for a moment, uh, and put this in a little bit of perspective. I remember in 1996 walking out of the argument, walking out of the Supreme Court after the oral argument in Romer. And at that point, we framed the issue as can a government have separate rules for gay and non gay people to achieve anti discrimination protections? And then uh, 2003 walking out after the argument in Lawrence, and there the question was, can the government have different criminal rules with respect to the sexual intimacy of same sex and different sex partners? And so now here we are asking yet a third round of the different rules question, can a government have different rules with respect to marriage recognition for same and different sex couples? And one other small uh, point I want to note, just to again put this in perspective, is uh, on the last Tuesday in March, when the Perry case is argued before the Supreme Court, it will have been exactly 10 years since Paul Smith stood in front of the Supreme Court and argued the Lawrence case. So when we think about uh, the gay and lesbian civil rights movement in this kind of time trajectory, the move from 1996 in Romer, 2003 in Lawrence, to 2013, of course not knowing what 2013 yet will hold for us, uh, but even the fact that the questions are before the court is really quite extraordinary. And I think nothing that um, certainly anybody like me who had started working at Lambda Legal Defense in uh, 1991 would have ever imagined. So with that, let's get started and uh, chat about standing. And can these cases even be heard? Um, this is an issue that both Walter and I weighed in on in amicus briefs uh, to the court in the Perry case. And so Walter, uh, let's turn to you to get us started. What about standing? Can the court here get to the merits in Perry? Uh, well, I, you know, I, I think it's debatable. Uh, and you and I, Suzanne and I have agreed on this for a very long time. Uh, three years ago, uh, I wrote in Slate that the great 
California gay marriage case is over and gay marriage won. Uh, and that is uh, because I wrote that on the day that the time for appealing Judge Vaughn Walker's decision and validating Prop 8 and holding that uh, it violated equal protection and due process to deny gay couples the same right to marry uh, as other couples. Uh, when the time for appealing that expired and the government defendants, who were the governor, the attorney general, and the county clerks for Los Angeles and Alameda counties, when none of the four government defendants appealed, I said the case is over. We can discuss what the effect would be of that decision, what, what, what is the consequence of a district court decision that is not a class action. I think a quite complicated and interesting question, but not one that in my view is before the court because the case was over uh, at that point. Now, um, it purports to be alive, and it's purported to be alive through the Ninth Circuit, a reference to the California Supreme Court, back to the Ninth Circuit, now to the Supreme Court, uh, at the behest of uh, three individual, four individuals who intervened who were uh, four of the five official proponents of, prop, uh, of, of, of Proposition 8, which said that marriage can only be between persons of opposite sex in California. And they argued that they had a right to intervene, uh, defend the validity, and appeal. And that's the issue. Do they have the kind of stake in the outcome that uh, Article 3 of the Constitution would uh, permit? Uh, and I view the answer to that question is no. Now, it should be noted that they, I think, quite properly were able to defend a challenge to the validity of the passage of Proposition 8 in California State Court. After Prop 8 was adopted, you know, the, the sequence of events was that the California Supreme Court, in way back in in -ray marriage cases, held there was a right to same-sex marriage under the California Constitution. Proposition 8 was shortly thereafter put on the ballot, and it passed, and it overturned that decision of the California Supreme Court and returned California state law to where it was before. I think in some sense, whatever happens in this case, Proposition 8 will remain valid. It changed California constitutional law. Even if there's a federal right to same-sex marriage, if a more conservative court reversed that in 10 years, then Prop 8 would still be there. I mean, there's nothing that is the, it, it did the one and only thing it could do, which is to change California state constitutional law and make California state constitutional law the same as North Carolina state constitutional law. There's no state constitutional right to gay marriage. Now, supporters of gay marriage challenged Prop 8, and the referendum supporters were allowed to defend it that it was validly adopted. It was a amendment, not a revision. It met the requirements of a, of a valid amendment on the California sale, and that they could do. But once that was, it, Prop 8 was established as valid, as California state law. The two couples brought suit seeking a constitu federal constitutional right to gay marriage. And at that point, in our view, the referendum sponsors had no more interest in the case than any other California citizen that is opposed to gay marriage. They had no stake in the outcome. They had no harm. Indeed, it would be unthinkable. The case might not have been brought for another 10 years that you would hunt down the five people that supported this. Only four of them joined at this time. Find them in their retirement homes. Ask them, do they want to litigate this? Ask them, do they want to litigate as applied challenges? They literally have no stake in the outcome. Now, that, and I'll try to make this brief, Suzanne. That analysis was complicated a bit because the, uh, the Ninth Circuit said, well, let's ask the California Supreme Court whether they're agents of the state of California. So there are two ways, of, and the California Supreme Court came back and said, they do represent the interest of the state, and they can advocate the interest of the state. Now, to many people, that settled the matter because the California Supreme Court has said they do, under California law, represent, uh, represent the state. We make two points in the amicus brief that was filed uh, in, in my name by uh, Irving Gors uh, Gornstein um, as the lead lawyer on that. Uh, and that is that there are two possible arguments for standing. One is that they have a personal stake in the outcome, which I think is easily refuted, they don't. The other is that they have been, that the state of California has standing, and they are there as the agent of the state of California. And our answer to that is no, they're not. They're not agents. The word is never used by the California Supreme Court. They have none of the indicia of an agency relationship. They're not accountable to the state or to the people. 
They have no fiduciary obligation to represent the interest of the state. They have shown no interest in considering the effect on other state provisions and policies in California of the arguments they've made. The California Supreme Court, even in a great giveaway, said, we don't have to answer the question of what will happen to the attorney's fees in this case, which could be considerable. It's David Boyce and Ted Olson. <laughs> because that's a question we don't have to resolve. But that question should be a simple one if they're the agents of the state. Of course the state would be responsible for the attorney's fees. There wouldn't be any, wouldn't be any debate about that if you're the agent of the state. There's never created an agency relationship which would in fact mean that it is the state of California represented by the agency of these four individuals that is before the court. And what we would say is a, a, a sort of a new rule we that suggested in my brief, Suzanne has others, is that you look to common law principles of agency. If you don't meet those standards, you can't have Article Three standing. So that's where I think we are, uh, and and that offers the the court a chance, an opportunity to decide the Doma case, and then to leave Judge Walker's ruling standing in California and leave for another day. Uh, the hearing a dispute in a 50 state uh, gay marriage issue for, for, a, for another day when the next case comes before the court, which could be a couple of years, right? Follow up with that. Yeah. Great. So thank you. So let me, let me jump in and just ask myself a question. And, uh, offer a She's a, uh, Suzanne, we, we lost our moderator when it snowed. So Suzanne is, is a, a talking, participating, <laughs> the day it didn't snow, but yeah. Suzanne is a, a, is a participating moderator, so don't get <laughs> breaking out the moderator role. She, is, she gets to ask herself as many questions as us. Exactly. <laughs> I, I should have just asked for right. two chairs, really, right. so you could see which, more clearly which role so I'm in. Exactly. Uh, so I just want to add quickly one other piece of a theory on the standing issue, which is something that my colleague Henry Monaghan and I introduced in our amicus brief, which is this idea of Article Three double dipping. And basically, the I, the point is that in the Prop Eight case, it is not. There are the reasons that Walter just mentioned that the that the sponsors of Proposition Eight cannot function as the state's agent uh, based on common law fiduciary duty uh, uh, points. There's also the, the, this point, which is that this is not a case where California did not take a position, right? Actually, the, high, the chief law enforcement of, officer of California, the attorney general, filed an answer, submitted an answer to the complaint in the case in which he accepted and agreed that Proposition 8 violates the constitutional rights of the same-sex couple plaintiffs. Therefore, the only way that private actors or any other party, purported party, could come in and advocate the state's interests is if the state can, in a sense, bifurcate its Article 3 standing. Right? So we have some for ourselves in which we say, we. We agree that this law is unconstitutional. We're going to split it in half, and then uh, toss some other Article Three stand, half of our give half of our Article Three standing over to the sponsors of an initiative who want to say that the initiative is constitutional. And so, it's, I developed this at much greater length, which I won't go into here in an online law review piece. If you're if you're interested, you can find it by Article Three double dipping. Uh, but at any rate, the, the basic point is that when we're talking about a state's interest, Article Three interest, in coming before a court to defend its laws, which it surely has, uh, it not only cannot just assign that away to private actors who don't have the state's enforcement interests at heart, but also in this kind of case where the state has taken a position, it doesn't have that interest to assign away to private actors unless the state can bifurcate its uh, its interest in a particular measure, half of the state saying this is unconstitutional, and half of the state's interest saying it's not. Um, uh, I don't know if we're going to weigh in on standing, Paul. Well, I, I tend to, we're not going to too much, much of the debating society, but I tend to think these arguments are quite powerful, uh, and that uh, it's difficult to answer the question of what it is about these proponents that makes them have part of the standing to file the appeal. Mm -hmm. The other aspect of this, of course, is that it uh, creates a very desirable, potentially desirable offering for reaching the merits of the area. If you are a centrist justice who doesn't think it's time to answer the big question that you know, presented there, and looking for another way to uh, sort of 
defer the issue for a while while the next case comes, comes up. So that, that's uh, something that I think is one of the more likely potential outcomes. Um, it does raise interesting questions about what it is a state would have to do to solve this problem uh, and how, how hyper-technical is the rule, leaving aside the double dipping problem, which is an interesting one. Under Walter's analysis, I suppose that you could have a rule in California that proponents could go to the Attorney General's office and fill out a form to be deemed private Attorney General to defend the referendum or the initiative and speak to the interests of the people who actually voted for this. After all, there were the majority of the citizens of California did uh, pass this constitutional amendment, and they have, they have real interests in it. In it. Uh, and at that point, they would be presumably speaking for the state or agents of the state. This would have consequences. Their decisions then would bind the state. They would, whatever the Attorney General said, uh, the Attorney General would essentially be transformed into an amicus of some sort. And I guess maybe maybe that would work under under Article Three. Or I don't know why the, whether the double dipping problem would continue. Uh, well, I think I, I think Suzanne's analysis is brilliant. The double dipping analysis and it points out the fact that the state simply hasn't given up its authority. And when we apply the agency rule, it, it fits with that nicely because the state, if it really had an, an agency relationship, would have given up its authority in a way that it did not uh, in this case. For example, ag agents have to be removable to be agents. And I know nowhere else in our uh, government except for, for Article Three judges do people have life tenure. Uh, the, these proponents seem to have life tenure for the rest of their lives. Uh, they would have the ability to represent under the, uh, the what the California Supreme Court said that Judge Reinhardt accepted. For the rest of their lives, they would be able to step forward and represent the interests of the, of the state. That makes no sense. One way thing, if you have five people that are eligible to do this for the rest of their lives, before they decide they don't want to do it in some hypothetical case 10 years from now, they, they would, their voice wouldn't be heard. Only the person who wanted to defend it, presumably. Well, and in a sense, right, the, the state could allow the sponsors to step in, or the sponsors could hold themselves up to step in, but what is significant about being a sponsor, right? The significance of being a sponsor of an initiative in California, or really any state, is that you, you're the one who proposes the language, you get to vet the arguments in favor of your initiative in the uh, voter guide. I don't know how many people actually read the official voter guides as opposed to reading all of the billboards, but nonetheless, you get to do that and you're responsible to collect signatures. None of the initiative law frameworks give an initiative sponsor any interest in, a me in their measure after it has passed. So in that sense, it could not only be an initiative sponsor, but perhaps a donor, right? Or anybody else who cares about the initiative. You know, I think a state, could do, a state could do this. They, a, a state could say, and, and, and we should know what the what the emotional appeal of the argument is on the other side. The referendum process is used uh, historically uh, in the, from the progressive era as a way to curb the authority of the insiders in government. The, 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 the paradigmatic case of a referendum is one that curbs what government officials have been doing, initiated and voted by the people. For those same, or some subset of those state officials then to ignore or undercut or not defend the referendum seems inconsistent, and that's inconsistent with its very function. But that doesn't, is a problem that's not solvable by having the Supreme Court adjudicate a case where there's no adversity in the Article Three sense. So what a state could do is a state could certainly say that a, a model on the old independent council, oh, a three-judge court could appoint, uh, it, with any referendum, could appoint special counsel who would have all the authority of the state. Someone not in state government, in the, if the state wanted to do that, it could have an independent counsel. You could appoint Kenneth W. Starr, you know, to represent the interests of the state of California. That would avoid the double dipping problem because it would be uh, the you know the interest. Of the that, attorney general, essentially. It, yeah, essentially would would appoint for that for that purpose. But that's not what is happening. Here. These people are not agents of the state of California in that sense, and that's why, as Suzanne points out, California has held back its own its own right to participate. What's interesting, though, is, to, is the reason this problem occurred is that the Attorney General of California, and I guess the Governor, too, didn't follow the model that the Justice Department followed in the Doma case, where the well, administration changed sides uh, and nevertheless took the position that it was duty-bound and, and owed it to the court <coughs> and to the whole system to file a notice of appeal and file a cert petition, uh, even though it had said at, in, the, in the Windsor 
case in the trial court, and they're not going to appeal it because they thought the uh, statute was unconstitutional. That was, that was always their position that they would continue to not only continue to enforce it, but take the procedural steps necessary so that there was a valid uh, appeal. Of course, that's where the issue is being briefed whether they can continue to do that. Uh, at, having taken a position on the merits that the uh, decision below was right, they can still file a cert petition and, and a notice of appeal in the Second Circuit. My, my own view is that procedure ought to be allowed, that, that the system won't fall, falls apart when people don't do that. And in fact, I think you can criticize the California Attorney General for not doing the same thing, uh, having said we're going to take our position on the merits. But we think that this, this case should not be decided by a single district judge uh, in San Francisco, that there ought to be a resolution at, at a higher level. The so Denver, I'm sorry, can I ask you what, if you had formulated a view, you know, it surprised everyone, I think, when the court, or it surprised a number of people that the court actually raised on its own a jurisdictional question in the Doma case, the Federal Defense of Marriage Act case. Uh, have you opined on uh, the standing issues in, in Doma? Well, I, I have to right now, right? <laughs> or would you like to right now? I the opportunity to opine. Um, no, I, I, so there are two, as everybody probably knows, there are two different standing issues in DOMA. One is the question that Paul just framed, which is, I think, the significant question for purposes of that case. Can the uh, Justice Department uh, bring up on appeal the, valid, the it, a challenge to the constitutionality of DOMA when it agrees in substance on the merits with the Second Circuit, which struck DOMA as unconstitutional? The other standing issue in the DOMA case, which is the Windsor case, uh, is can the bipartisan legal advisory group of the House of Representatives, does that group have standing to uh, seek cert? Uh, because it is the group that intervened successfully to defend DOMA below. Let me just say a quick word about BLAG, the bipartisan legal advisory group. Uh, two quick words, actually. Uh, one, I actually think that they were not properly allowed to intervene to defend DOMA in this case or in any case. Also, because I'm a law professor, have an article that addresses this at some length. There's plenty of footnotes, happy to share it. But uh, probably what you're more interested in is, the, and what it will be more, what is more interesting to the court certainly is the standing issue. And I think the arguments that we just talked about with respect to the Proposition 8 sponsors apply in many of the same ways to the, uh, to the bipartisan legal advisory group, which does not represent that did not represent the House until Jan this past January when it had formal, got formal authorization and does not represent the full Congress. There are very interesting questions, I think, about whether even Congress can defend a statute uh, as a party when uh, the Justice Department declines to defend. But let's actually focus more on this harder made or more important question about the Justice Department. There, I, I'll just say quickly and then turn it over to Walter, who has, has uh, has actually opined on this uh, at, at more length um, for many years, that, for many years uh, and has some personal experience that I agree very much with Paul that uh, both for constitutional reasons and policy reasons, con constitutionally but also policy-wise, uh, the government can is an aggrieved party and can seek cert and can uh, carry a case forward at the Supreme Court even if it agrees with the merits decision by the circuit court. But Walter, why don't you tell us well, what you're really the, the fundamental difference between the standing issues in the California case and the federal DOMA case is that the state defendants in California did not appeal Judge Walker's decision striking it down. And in the DOMA case, the United States did file a notice of appeal and indeed then a cert petition. Uh, in the case, and that to me solves the standing issue. The question is, is that is 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 the standing conferred by the fact that the United States appeal from an adverse judgment eliminated because the Attorney General and the Solicitor General announced that they and the President actually agree with the reasoning of the court below? And my answer is that's an easy question. Of course, it doesn't deprive the court of jurisdiction. We know that there was standing, that there was an Article Three controversy in the district court. Uh, Edith Windsor was married for decades, was a same-sex partner for decades, married finally in Canada. Uh, her wife died, and normally the estate would pass among spouses. Their marriage was legitimate in the state of New York. Their marriage, the, the, the estate would pass without having to pay estate taxes among spouses. 
but because the Defense of Marriage Act says that federal law does not recognize what states have done in any state that does same-sex marriage. The IRS said she owed $360,000 in estate taxes because the federal government would not recognize the fact that New York considers this a marriage. Now, people think, I keep hearing people talk about California as the big case, but that, you, DOMA is enormously important. No one is really married in this country, even if they're in California or Washington, D.C. or whatever, as long as DOMA exists. Because if you're not married for a thousand purposes, if you're not married for Social Security, military survivors' benefits, military housing, federal estate tax purposes, immigration purposes, you know, it's hard to say that you are, that you are, are truly married. And that this is a, a law which overrides in an area of traditional state competence of marriage that Congress has stepped in to say we're not going to allow states to, you know, to, to do this. So there clearly is, Ms. Windsor wants her $360,000 and the IRS wants to keep it. And the, and, and, the minimum, they're under order to pay it. Right, now, now when they're under order to pay it, it seems to me that they, they have two interests here. One is the interest in, in the United States has an interest in not paying out $360,000 until it has been assured that it is constitutionally required to do so. When a statute says, keep that money, and you're a federal officer, you have an interest on behalf of the United States in not paying that until you are told in a fairly definitive way by the last court that will hear the case that you may pay the money out that you're forbidden to pay by federal statute. <coughs> the second interest is, is just another way to state it, that the president has an interest, the United States has an interest in having its laws enforced until they are declared to be unconstitutional by a court that has had an opportunity to do so. And that is an interest too, even if the president agrees. So it was surprising in that sense, particularly given the precedence of a case called U.S. versus Lovett and the Chada case, where the government had appealed cases to the Supreme Court, even though it agreed with the, with the judgment law. Surprisingly, they did. I think they want to really criticize the Solicitor General for not defending DOMA. And I think that's what that, that, uh, that's a, an hour set aside to beat up on the Solicitor General and the President is the only reason I can see to grant that. And so let me, I could just say a word defending their decision. The standard rule is, and every Solicitor General has defended cases that he or she doesn't agree with. Uh, you know, you basically suck it up and defend, you know, acts of Congress, unless there is no plausible argument that you can make. Now, that's not true of DOMA. There is a plausible argument you can make, A, that rational basis is the proper test, and B, that under rational basis it survives scrutiny. Uh, because it's more convenient for the federal government to have a single rule. <clears throat> it's not uh, irrational in the most limited sense of that, or at least that's a plausible argument. We don't all necessarily agree about that. Uh, no, 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 I will come to that. We'll get to the merits. I, 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 I will the merits. All I said was there's a plausible argument on that, and I think the government did a, a, a really brilliant job of saying if you, if you have even rational basis with the added focus required here, that it fails to meet that standard. I thought it was a very deft way of, of dealing with that issue. But those that say, I, I think what that analysis or criticism of the Solicitor General fails to, to, to note is that you need to break this issue down into its component parts. And when you do, it seems really clear to me that the government did the only thing it could properly do in this administration. Because first of all, when it got to the Second Circuit, the Second Circuit had never decided the level of scrutiny. There was no precedent on the level of scrutiny to be applied to sexual orientation <laughs> discriminations. So the government had to brief that for the first time under this administration. And there were really two essential questions. You generally assume that legislative, uh, legislative distinctions are based upon some reasonable basis. You generally assume that. When you apply more skeptical scrutiny when, especially when two circumstances are present, when there's been a history of discrimination, which would call into question whether it's really a fair legislative judgment, and where the criteria in question is not one that, that is a good indicator of merit. 
where it's not one that's normally related with the ability to contribute or not normally related to legitimate policy. And when those things are true, you ask a court to apply heightened scrutiny, which DOMA cannot survive? I think that's an easy question. So what is this administration going to do? Is it going to argue? So it seems to me that you then take that, where you've got a plausible argument, you need to take it to the president, and they did that in this case. They took it to the president, because the president has an independent constitutional authority. He is the head of a branch of government. And the president can make a determination of whether having listened to those who advise him, whether he believes that there are continuing effects of discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Yes, he believes there is. Does he believe that sexual orientation is a criteria that is normally related, a good indicator of merit or related to ability to contribute? No, he does not. When he reaches those conclusions, it necessarily follows that they believe that heightened scrutiny is what ought to be applied in the court. And that, to me, is a presidential level decision and the right one and therefore the, the Attorney General makes it, even though it would not be implausible, in my view, to make some other argument. It's almost stronger than that, because on, on this particular issue, the President has a responsibility and an opportunity to weigh in on what he thinks about these fundamental issues of social policy, and, and he did so, and it followed from that that the government writes a strong <coughs> brief in Doma arguing that uh, height scrutiny should apply. Uh, and that and the, and the DOMA fails that. Thank you. So, so, so we are shifting into the merits part of our conversation right now, even though, as you could probably sense, we could all talk for a few more hours about the standing issues, too. Uh, both Paul and I filed briefs on the merits in the Windsor case. Uh, I filed one with Ann Hunter, who's a professor here at Georgetown. And <clears throat> so, Paul, let, let me turn to you first. So we think about DOMA. The question is, as Walter just laid it out, or one of the questions is, what standard of review should be applied to the distinction between gay and non-gay people that, or gay and non-gay couples' marriages that DOMA makes? Uh, and and what, so, so tell us, what do you think? Well, this whole issue of scrutiny has been an interesting one in the DOMA litigation since the very beginning. When I worked with GLAD, and we filed the first case in Massachusetts challenging DOMA in 2009, almost at the same time the Perry case was filed. Um, and we, we came to the conclusion that of two things. We should, we should start arguing very expressly for heightened scrutiny, which is not something that the gay rights lawyers had been doing much before that. If you go back to Lawrence or uh, other cases in that era, there was reluctance to argue for heightened scrutiny in part because if, if you won it, it would, uh, you didn't want to lose it. And if you won it, it would prove too much. You didn't think you could win it. It would mean the military had to be integrated. It would mean marriage had to be done across the country, et cetera. But we started saying, it's time to do this. Uh, and at the same time, we wanted to make clear we thought that we could win under rational basis scrutiny. So heightened scrutiny is required, but rational basis is enough. And was, we ended up winning in both the lower courts in Massachusetts on uh, rational basis. The position that I think is correct is the one that, that Walter just laid out, that heightened scrutiny has to apply to discrimination against uh, gay, gay men and lesbians, that it is the classic remaining category out there that fits the criteria of history of oppression and discrimination that continues. Uh, unrelated to your ability to contribute, not politically powerful enough to protect themselves against these forms of oppression and discrimination, and a characteristic people shouldn't have to change in order to avoid being oppressed. Those are kinds of, that argument is essentially airtight in my view, and so the court may duck it again simply by not addressing it, but I find it hard to believe there would be five justices who actually reject it. It's hard to see how you would even write that brief. Uh, and so, uh, Certainly, Mr. Clement has worked very hard to figure out things to say about it that were mostly plausible. Uh, but we, the brief that we wrote for uh, Land Legal and uh, Glad and the Supreme Court in the Windsor case says, we agree with all that, but you don't need to go there if you don't want to. Apply rational basis the way rational basis has come to be applied in a series of cases, uh, culminating in, in the Rover case, but also the Moreno case, the Cleveland case, other cases. And we tried to isolate the specific characteristics of a law that uh, would violate rational basis and really identify the reasons why the assumption that rational basis means you owe, you owe the plaintiff almost loses is just not true. That there are situations in which uh, rational basis scrutiny uh, nevertheless requires that a law be held unconstitutional. And it has to do with some of the same criteria that go into the heightened scrutiny uh, uh, analysis, which is to say, does this target a, a group of people who are disfavored in society? Uh, and uh, does the, 
is there a sense of analyst in the background? Um, but also, are there important personal interests at stake? That, that, that could also be a way you can get to heightened scrutiny sometimes under the protection. So here we said to the court, you know, this is obviously a historically disfavored group. There are important personal interests at stake. The, the recognition of people's marriages is, is one of the most obvious examples of that. And it's a historically anomalous law, a, a law where the federal government is purporting to set marriage policy, even though for 100, 200 years it's been clear in our system that that's not the job of the federal government. We went on and talked about some other aspects of the DOMA that fit the bill. Much like the law in Romer, it's an extraordinarily broad law that, that makes people's marriages not count for a thousand different things that have nothing to do with each other, in many cases ex extremely irrationally. Uh, and so that is the kind of addition, I think, to the court that this isn't something that was done for legitimate purposes to serve some economically rational basis or, or, or the like. Uh, and so you ought to take this seriously as a rational basis case. The other thing, the other thing about the rational basis argument, and I haven't worked on these cases now for several years, it's extremely hard to articulate even a rational basis, even a traditional rational basis for this law, because it, it is a really crazy law. It doesn't apparently save the government any money, it apparently costs the government money, or at least that's what the government itself concluded when at the one time they studied the issue. And it is invasive of the state's prerogatives in a way that is very troubling, I think, under the way the Constitution ordinarily is applied. And so they have struggled mightily to find ways to uphold the law even under a rational basis. And so what you'll see, and I do encourage you, if you haven't, to look at the array of briefs, and there's quite a wide array of briefs, including, I, I haven't actually done the full count, but certainly in the between Perry and Windsor, over a hundred amicus yeah. briefs, probably. Uh, the, what, what you'll see is, is really essentially what Paul said, that in different ways, many of the briefs, including the party's briefs, uh, advocating to invalidate Do uh, DOMA, make the point that this is a, an extraordinary, broad, sweeping piece of legislation that blocks out marriage recognition for same-sex couples in in an enormous array of contexts, from uh, provision of benefits for children to burial in various military cemeteries to immigration rights and beyond, and that there is not an argument, not a plausible, rational basis, even under the most deferential form of review, that could explain that kind of singling out and lopping off of just one subset of marriages in the United States to say you get none of this. Uh, <clears throat> We'll talk in a moment about some of the, the, the uniformity justification, which I think we ought to address, because that has some superficial appeal to right. some people. Uh, but before we do that, I want to mention just one other thing, because um, it may be something that people haven't thought about so much um, that we tried to bring out, Nan Hunter and I tried to bring out in the brief that we uh, offered up, which, which the, the essential point of our amicus brief is that the court has been, the, the, the law or the jurisprudence of rational basis review has been, uh, to put it probably a little generously, a bit murky, right? So that you have what many people would consider two lines, roughly, of rational basis cases, one the extremely deferential line, and the other the sort of what are often called the rational basis with bite cases. And the point that we make in the brief, which is actually quite similar to the point that Paul just made, is that the cases aren't all so far apart when you look at them carefully because what you're looking at when you see the group that when you look at the classification, the line that the government draws, the kind of singling out that's done, is if there are these indicia of invidiousness, either because the group has been long stigmatized or subjected to uh, historically to discrimination, or because in the political context of a law's passage, the, uh, there are these, the, the circumstances of, of uh, marginal, political marginalization of the group were particularly acute, then we have cause to be concerned. And at that point, we're going to look, as the court, the court is going to look, as it consistently has across a wide array of cases, a little bit more carefully at the justification. <laughs> and often it turns out that when the political process has been skewed and a minority group of any sort has been singled out, that that this is that that <clears throat> the uh, singling out was either discriminatory or arbitrary. And the thing that I want to point out to you is that if you look back at the text of footnote four, right, which we all think, oh, that's about discrete and insular minorities, 
actually when the court talks about the uh, that we need to apply uh, considerably more searching, re correspondingly more searching review when the political process has failed. It's talked about race cases and religion cases, religious discrimination cases. It also points to a truckers case, a case about in-state truckers and out-of-state truckers, and out-of-state truckers being burdened. And if you look at that case, that case talks about a lot more cases in which out-of-state parties are burdened for some reason or another because the political, the, the political process was set up in a way that was destined to burden that group and could have the potential to lead to unfair, uh, in illegitimate forms of discrimination. And so the point that we're making is that in the 21st century, given the enormous pluralism of the United States, looking at the indicia of invidiousness and then at, the, at, at the, the disproportionate nature of a burden on the group would actually be a more useful way generally for the Supreme Court to approach equal protection review, even though we agree absolutely that heightened scrutiny applies here. So let me turn it over to Walter to weigh in on the merits. Well, on the, uh, on the question of whether there's a plausible rational basis argument, first of all, I don't think there's a, the argument is overwhelming on heightened scrutiny. I think you all have effectively answered the most plausible rational basis argument with your across the board point. Because the most rational argument would be this. Look, the federal government moves people around all the The federal government exists in all 50 states. We transfer people all the time. We have to decide that, you know, we need to reassign Paul Smith from the lawyer's division of the agency here to one we've just created in West Virginia. And all of a sudden, you know, the person you're transferring says, look, I'm going to lose all of my, my, if I move to West Virginia from Maryland, <coughs> we're going to lose all of our spousal benefits. Uh, I am just not going to agree to be transferred to West Virginia or Oklahoma. I can be transferred to Massachusetts or Oregon or, you know, whatever, but not, uh, and, and that, so the government say, look, we're not going to recognize any spouses for any purposes, and, and, you know, for employment purposes, and therefore, uh, every, every federal employee is going to be denied everything, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. You're going to have no more rights if you're in, if you're in Maryland than if you're in Mississippi. Uh, so that, uh, and, and you could have uniformity either way, but the answer to that would simply be 42 day. You know, it's rational now because most states don't recognize gay marriage, so that's the answer to it. Now, I think one answer to that is that you can, even if, even if that were on its own uh, a sort of plausible basis. The problem is that this is not a statute about federal government employees. It is the fact that it applies to a thousand statutes, none of which were even probably considered by the Congress in any detail whatsoever, bespeaks only hostility. How could you possibly, could Congress possibly know whether it was rational to deny burial in a military cemetery? to someone who was lawfully married in the military, spent their entire career in the state. They spend their entire career, they get married, they spend their entire career in the Army, stationed in the state that recognizes the legitimacy of marriage. They, they, they live, die, and are married in that state. How is what rational basis is for denying military you know, burial rights? Congress didn't care because all it cared about was this sweeping across the board matter. And that bespeaks a desire to harm an unpopular group. It can't possibly be a sort of rational cost-benefit analysis times a thousand. They never did that. And that's why I think that's a really powerful rational basis response to any, uh, we just needed a uniform rule. Well, you didn't even consider whether you needed a uniform rule in all of these myriad different uh, areas. And maybe plausibly there would be an argument for me somewhere, but not for this statute. So that's why if you give it any kind of um, uh, and, and so what the United States says to the court is to the extent that sexual orientation may be considered to fall short in some dimension on achieving heightened scrutiny, even if it fell short, if you thought it fell short in some dimension, the fact that there is indisputably the history of discrimination and the absence of a, of a, of a relationship to merit uh, uh, make it a uniquely qualified for the kind of added focus level of heightened scrutiny 
which his whole purpose is to make sure that you're, you're guarding against giving an effect to a desire to harm an unpopular group. It wouldn't take much. And that's why I think it's a very, very strong uh, argument. Let me say, I think when we look back on this, when I read the briefing by Paul uh, Clement and, and, and Charles Cooper, uh, uh, Cooper in the California case, Clement representing the, the House Republicans, basically, though. These are very good lawyers. And the arguments are very, very weak. And in reading it, I realized, I had the fact, I'm going to finish reading one of the briefs, I thought, you know, Paul Smith won this 10 years ago. The argument that they sort of want to make, the, the sort of the, the gorilla of the argument is, this is the, the essence of these relationships is the, the abominable and detestable crime against nature, which people will have for, you know, for a millennium of uh, disapproved of morally, and the government can act upon that moral disapproval. That's really what the opposing argument is. That's the big, big opposing. And, and Lawrence against Texas took it out. And so it's like trying to write a novel without the letter E or something. <laughs> so, uh, the, 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 the argument was, I didn't really realize to what extent the argument I keep thinking they want to make, they keep, they keep running headlong into Lawrence against Texas. Isn't that it? I completely agree with that. And it's like, just throw in there, Justice Scalia basically recognized that in his dissent 10 years ago, that the argument, once you take out morality, there's really nothing left. Right. Uh, let me just, if I could just address this uniformity point. The uniformity point has been an interesting one all the way through. It, they haven't really generally briefed it as an issue of federal government employees. They, they've basically been making two arguments that they have a, an interest to, under the rational basis test to treat all same sex couples the same, whether they're married or not, or whether they're in states where they can get married or not. And that somehow that's an interest to, to make sure that they're not discriminating against unmarried same sex couples in favor of married ones, which, when you think about it, it's kind of a bizarre argument because the rule is married people are different from unmarried people. In, in the gay world, we're going to suddenly worry about eliminating that, that horrible discrimination based on marital status. They're trying to keep the gay community yeah. together. Because they want to create this <laughs> unhappiness among unmarried gay couples that they can't get on anyway. That argument, I think, makes no sense. The second argument they make is lots of people move from states where they've been married to states where their marriages are not recognized. And unless and until that policy is challenged under the Equal Protection Clause, they're, for some purposes, in the new state they move to, unmarried. And that creates complexity uh, in the administration of federal programs because you have to have a rule for each program about whether or not these people under this federal program who are not recognized as married where they live but are recognized as married where they got married ought to be treated as married under this, this statute or that statute. And the answer to that that we've given is, is sort of double. What One is um, this is a, a, a tail wagging the dog. The vast majority of people who get married in Massachusetts don't move to Texas with their, with their spouse. They, uh, so it is a, a problem that relates to a very small percentage of the people at issue. And there's, second of all, there is a solution that doesn't require you to take away rights from the vast majority of these couples who don't move from Massachusetts, which is to say, have a choice of law rule. You can either make it the law of the place you reside now, or the law of the place where you celebrated your marriage, or some other rule, or we could have different rules for different statutes. Right. They've, they've had rules like this. Well, for these statutes for, for for a long time, because lots of states have not recognized other states' marriages in the past. It's not going to be, wouldn't be as many as it might happen now, but common law marriages, marriages to first cousins, interracial marriages, this issue is not a new one. And so there are, the, the, the rationale ultimately just falls apart simply because there are, there are ways that are less oppressive and discriminatory to solve any perceived problem, uh, if there was one. So let me just, I know we're, we're going to open up to questions in a moment, so let me just flag a couple of additional issues. Uh, one, I, I certainly, I think both Paul and I agree with Walter's point that this is fundamentally, like the, the raging argument underneath it all is about morality and moral disapproval. A piece of that argument that also comes out in the rationales that are offered by the government, by, excuse me, by Blag and by the defenders of Proposition 8 is that we don't want these people of whom we morally disapprove to have children, right? That's the procreation argument, that the Defense of Marriage Act and Proposition 8 are both justified because we want to steer, well, the, the, let me say that it's very wacky. <laughs> every time I have the same one, every time I try to describe this argument you're about to describe, it is so wacky that it's really hard to get out of it. So, so let me try again. So, so I think what it underlies the argument, this is where I was getting tongue-tied, what underlies the argument is 
we don't want gay people having kids, and we want to discourage that. That is not the argument that is made explicitly. That is the underlying argument. There are a variety of reasons they can't make that argument. One is they can't stop gay people from having children and, and raising children together. Uh, there are constitutional arguments as well. Uh, but what the argument actually is, is that we want to keep marriage exclusively to male-female couples so that we can channel all of that un, all of that irresponsible procreation. Keep the biological parents stable together and responsible for the children that they produce. Right. Leaving aside entirely that many married couples do not have biological children, if they have children at all, uh, the, the, it, the, the, the point really is that it's quite an extraordinary argument, although it is one that has been accepted by some courts, including the, uh, home, the highest court in my own state, New, the New York Court of Appeals, in rejecting uh, marriage rights for same-sex couples a number of years ago. Uh, but one of the issues, again, uh, there are obviously many, many problems with this argument, and as uh, both Paul and Walter said, it, I don't, none of us, I think, think it is an argument that could possibly be taken seriously by five members of the Supreme Court. So there's probably enough said about that. Uh, Can I ask you a question, though, that <laughs> it is a variant of this. Um, what did you think of the argument that it's not actually a discrimination based upon sexual orientation? because gay people can be married as long as they are of the opposite sex. They tried that, that, that in Lawrence I, I, I mean, and then, and then, I mean it, is, it is literally true, I suppose, that all they ask is not what your sexual orientation is, but whether you're the same or opposite sex. Did you think that I made sense? I remember that to argument that? from back yeah. in the days when anti-gay initiatives were rampant across the country, and actually the Sixth Circuit sort of accepted it to some degree. We don't understand the discrimination. It was a charter amendment that blocked protections for gay people. This is sort of, who is this group? What are the borders of the group? I mean, it's, I, I, it's an absurd argument in the way that the court also recognized that the argument, you know, that, that having a tax on yarmulkes is a tax on Jews, right. that the right. court recognized in the Christian Legal Society case right. that right. We can't, even though lower courts have previously endorsed a status conduct distinction, uh, it's, gone. We, it's gone. So I, I think it's just, it's not a credible argument. So we want to open up to questions. Let me just uh, do one more thing, which is to put the United States in a bit of a global context, right? To the extent anybody was under an illusion, under an illusion that we are a world leader in this area, we are very far behind the curve. Not just Canada and Mexico, but altogether 13 countries and with France and England moving very quickly toward marriage recognition, and countries all over the globe at this point uh, recognizing marriage for uh, same-sex couples. And as a colleague of mine is often fond of saying, the sky has not fallen yet. Although I guess we have now had a meteor, so who knows? <laughs> um, so let, let's open it up to questions, and I'd like to take questions from anybody with the media first, if, if anybody has any questions from the media. Can you just also identify yourself when you ask your question? Hi, it's Ken Jones with CQ Press. Um, if heightened scrutiny uh, is adopted uh, by in one or the other of the cases by the Supreme Court, what laws, what existing laws are imperiled, and would they, would that set include the gay marriage bans in 38 states? They may not say that, but that would be the case. I mean, it would be, as Walter indicated, essentially impossible to defend the constitutionality of excluding same-sex couples from marriage if you say that that requires a heightened justification comparable to race or gender discrimination. Uh, and so clearly those, I think, they may wait for a year for that to play out if they, if they get there. Or they, you know, they may say we don't need to reach that issue for precisely that reason if they want to defer it. But that would be the Yeah, here, and, and here's how it plays out, Lauren. The, um, This would be, in, in one sense, uh, to strike down Prop 8, go to the merits of the California case, would in one sense be a very big swing, because the court would have been validating the laws of 42 states. Um, remember that at the time of Brown, there were 13 states that had de jure segregation. At the time of Lawrence, there were 13 states 
I believe they have criminalized homosexual sodomy. There's a big, and, and the court has traditionally been more willing to bring the last one quarter of the states into line, uh, the Southeastern Conference of the Old Confederacy or whatever, than, a, uh, uh, than, it, than it has a nationwide, uh, you know, nationwide thing, no matter how powerful the legal argument is. Now, it is very, the support that was gained at the end of this process was quite impressive, from Fortune 500 companies to officials from Republican administrations to NFL players, that was really, uh, you know, a very impressive lineup. But uh, if the court were to adopt heightened scrutiny in DOMA and to hold that the there was no standing to appeal Judge Walker's decision, the extent of the of, of what his judgment would mean in California would be debated. But it would be debated in a context in which we had the DOMA decision. If DOMA is based on on if the court puts off reaching the sort of 50 state question in California, and, and, or perhaps in my view finds it can't reach it because there's nobody was standing before it. I actually believe in this. This is not just a strategic argument for me. I believe in this Article 3 point. Suzanne has written about it too. If they can't reach it, the state of the world is quite different because you'll have the decision in the Windsor case. And if that adopts heightened scrutiny, that's going to have a major effect on every ensuing lower court decision on a state gay marriage law is going to be applying, Windsor is the most relevant precedent. Don't you think, Walter, that if they don't have to do anything which decides to address the merits of the Doma case, they don't need to get to the heightened scrutiny issue, they will they would be more likely to uh, say to do Doma is heightened focus by the first right. circuit under uh, you know, heightened focus. Whatever you call it, right. right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's really not a hard opinion to write. Judge Medina right. already wrote it. Right. right. So we don't know what the world will look like in terms of how they write the opinion, but it, it will, uh, in one sense, it's in a very good posture because there's no need for the court to reach any harmful issue. You know, this, I, I think there are a number of off-ramps so that this is not the road to being the gay Plessy versus Ferguson, you know, that the court could could take if it doesn't reach, you know, the, 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 it's possible the issue, but I... Uh, and I think if we actually look at Historically, historically to uh, Romer and Lawrence, the court in those cases had the opportunity to go to heightened scrutiny to decide the question before it. It declined to do that, and I think people, some people were quite frustrated by the decision in Romer because it seemed to be headed down a heightened scrutiny path but didn't say so. It talked about an important liberty interest but never kind of came out and said, so therefore heightened scrutiny, never came out and said, therefore mm -hmm. fundamental right. Uh, my view is that that move is uh, not, uh, not particular to sexual orientation cases, although it has encompassed them, but it is consistent with what the Supreme Court has done in many cases now for a number of decades, which is not to announce a new level of review, but nonetheless to apply meaningful review. When we look back, it's now about, I think, 30 years or more since the court has added a new group to the, the uh, suspect classification categories. It's not to say it won't happen, and it certainly should happen, but as we've also talked about, it's not necessary. But to, to your question, right, if the court goes there, you know, the, if the court uh, grants heightened scrutiny, the marriage bans in the 38 states don't topple immediately. You know, we will have to see what happens in litigation, but it certainly wouldn't go well for them. Uh, so let me now follow uh, ACS policy, and if I can, group a couple of questions. Um, David. Uh, David Savage the LA Times. I just wanted to check back with you, Paul, on something you alluded to. Suppose the court strikes down DOMA, uh, a gay couple in Massachusetts files a joint tax return, and then next year they move to Missouri. I thought they would still, in their dealings with the federal government, they'd still be married, but you said it's, it's a little bit unclear. No, I think that the, the reality is if that's all they did is the, the, for the various federal statutes out there, there are different rules about whether, whether or not you view this marriage depending on which social security has a different rule where you live when you applied as opposed to uh, some other programs which taxation would maybe, I think it turns more on where you live now and whether you're married in the state where you live, that sort of thing. So there would be some complexities about dealing with that, complexities which I think they can solve if they want to pass a different statute discriminatory, but, but there would be issues out there uh, about sort of program by program whether that couple uh, would, would uh, be viewed as married by the federal government. 
so I'm writing this quickly and, and one morning in June. So I said say it's sort of uncertain what this means for no, it's complicated. It's not uncertain. There, there are rules on these Yeah, stuff. there's no one. It's better to say there's no one answer. There is an answer. That is to say, if you take DOMA off the books, anytime, anytime you marry, if you get a, if you are a resident of North Carolina and you get a Nevada divorce, I mean, this, the, the, the state laws now are almost all allowing no-fault divorce, but it used to be a big issue. If you were married in North Carolina, you got a no-fault divorce in Nevada, then you move to Oklahoma, Social Security had to make a decision about whether to recognize whether you were still married or not. You know, it, it had rules about whether it was the state of your domicile or the state of the divorce or the state of the marriage, and that had nothing to do. DOMA is an overlay. It says whatever the answer to that question is, if the people are of the same sex, they're not spouses in all thousand statutes. It still leaves the question of whose law, which law governs. Uh, uh, I mean, one of the things that makes DOMA somewhat an easier step for the court is that uh, it doesn't have the effect in, in the 42 states that don't recognize gay marriages, except insofar as, as people can carry their marriages you know, with purposes. them for federal purposes. But it, it, uh, I think first cousin marriages are a good example there because there are a number of states that recognize them and a number of states that don't. And so the question is, you know, if you move from New York, which does recognize first cousin marriages, to wherever else, which doesn't, um, uh, what happens? And there's just comparable issues. So can I see how many more people have questions? And based on that, we'll decide whether to group or just go one at a time. OK, so why don't we just, if, since we have, I think, about eight minutes, if you could each ask really quick questions, we'll each give a one minute response, and, and then we will uh, wrap up. And just remember to identify yourself before your question. Hi, I'm Linnea Erickson, who's from Third Way. Uh, my question is, I'm very persuaded by your uh, argument about lack of standing in the Prop 8 case. So then what happens? If there is no standing, uh, I've heard that maybe, you know, only the counties that were directly sued would have to abide by Von Walker's decision, or maybe the entire state would, or maybe it's messy. Can you answer that? Answer that in one minute, Walter. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> yes, it's, no, no, no. It, it's, it, it's not before, you know, the issue is not before the Supreme Court. When someone, if anyone resists, Vaughn Walker's judgment is quite broad. Uh, a, a county official wanted to resist that judgment might have standing to do so. Uh, or who was obviously sued for refusing to issue a license. And that gets played out in in California. But if I could just make one small point on the standing issue that is not as technical as it appears. And I want to suggest that what I wrote back in 2010 is that the issues of standing and the merits in this case are in deep resonance with one another. Leaking them is the fact that no one is injured when a gay couple is married. That's why there's standing issues all over this case. That is why the state has no rational reason to deny a license in the first place, and that is why there is no injured party who has real standing to, ca to carry forward the appeals. In an alternative universe, in which there were a finite number of marriage licenses, and a straight couple ordered to give up their marriage license in order to make one available to a gay couple, would have standing to sue and to appeal. But in the world in which we actually live, a straight couple's right to marry remains unimpaired by gay marriage. And, and that's why I say the case could be over and should be over, because no one has a legal interest in denying someone else's happiness. And let, let me just, if I could add on to that sort of beautiful point, this one, which is that when we think about what, is, what drove the court to let Prop 8 sponsors get as far as they have gotten in this process, I think it's quite understandable, right? It, it's sort of, you know, they did the work, right? So they should get to do it. They should get to defend it. It's a very kind of John Locke notion. You should you put in your work, you get to take out. But the that works fine in state courts, but we do have Article Three of the Constitution, which really does insist that federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction. And there are these standing rules into which the uh, decision that allowed the sponsors to have standing here would cut a gaping, gaping hole. So now that I have violated my own rule about the question collection also, I don't know where the mic is. Where's the, okay. So we really just have uh, very few minutes, so if we could just get sort of two to three 
one minute or less questions and we'll be very fast. Since under California law, I could marry my friend Jim here only if he had a sex change operation and became Jane, why isn't that sex discrimination? And why isn't anybody arguing that this is blatantly sex discrimination? It is and they are. There are arguments. There's actually a great amicus brief on that point. But well, that was the argument way back in the first case, the Hawaii case, it was sex discrimination argument. It's absolutely sex discrimination. Not only because of the male, female, male, male point, but because the only reason to keep in a sex-based distinction in marriage rules is to reinforce that there are gender distinctions in a way that the Constitution forbids. And look what happens now. States don't yeah, normally yeah. inquire. States do not normally inquire about the the, the gender of people seeking, you know, marriage licenses. What they're required to do is, what, what, what the federal government would be required to do for the first time, if, if DOMA really starts getting applied across the board as gay marriages start happening. For a long time we had DOMA and there were no states, you know, nobody was getting married, it was gay. So there were no administrative propositions. But the federal government gets a, a, a state tax return that doesn't declare the, the income, and the married couple was Tracy Smith and Addison Jones. And in a state that now does no longer restricts marriage to opposite sex couples, has no reason to inquire or to know. The license just says that uh, Tracy Smith and Addison Jones meet, you know, with a proper age and, and had the proper test and are qualified to be married, and they get a license. So when, when the estate passes, all of a sudden, IRS has got to say, wait, I can't tell from these names what gender these people are. They could be, you know, one could be a man, one could be a woman, they could be both a men, they could both be women. We got to have a federal inquiry into what the gender was. And nobody has really confronted the notion that that's what's coming down the road if DOMA gets applied as we expand the number of gay marriages and these issues begin to crop up where you, where you, uh, where you look behind what they normally need now is you submit the marriage license. So here's the marriage license, and it says, I was married to this person, and that's all you need. With DOMA, you've got to have this gender check. Well, we know the federal government has a tremendous uh, surplus of resources to be that's spending exactly time right. figuring out <laughs> what everybody's sex is. Um, we have maybe a 15 second question, and then we're wrapping up. Or well, I mean, I guess this is more of a, a, maybe a flippant point, but you know, do you think that I remember since I was working on the Hill when DOMA passed, um, and I remember it passed with a pretty overwhelming majority. Um, do you think Justice Scalia will take that into account? <laughs> 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 So why don't we each, you know, you know, you know. But I guess what we should, we should note here that um, on the, uh, you know, in, there are, I think it's more than 150 members of the House have signed on to an amicus brief urging that DOMA be invalidated. President Clinton, who signed DOMA, has recently expressed his uh, view that, that, that DOMA is now unconstitutional. I think many of us wished you would have taken a step further to say it was unconstitutional when I signed it, but that's a, a lot to ask of a, of a, of a president. And, and this is certainly wonderful that he weighed in. I think we're, why, why don't we each take, since we're basically at the end, you, we each want to take 30 seconds to sort of either predict or wrap up in any way you would like. <laughs> well, I don't think I'm going to predict that, but I, I guess I will say that it's, it's a complicated situation which the court gave itself by taking both of these cases at the same time. They easily could have sequenced them and done DOMA first to see, see where they were, but they ended up with complicated both jurisdictional questions in both cases and the merits, and then the, in the Perry case, a whole variety of ways that they could address the merits, narrowly and broadly. And so uh, my, my general sense is that the court is probably going to be somewhat more narrow in Perry than, they have, than the 50 state uh, case that, that people, some people would like to see. But we'll, you know, that's one thing I'll do. Uh, just to mention one small but intriguing <coughs> issue that is still being pressed before the Supreme Court, and that to me is quite revealing, and that is the issue of whether Judge Vaughn Walker should have recused himself, whether his judgment should be set aside for his failure to recuse himself after he reached his judgment in validating Prop 8. He did a resign from the bench, and he announced that he had had a long-term uh, same-sex relationship with a partner, and that acknowledgment has led to the recusal motion. What's interesting about that is that 
rule one of recusal law is that a judge is not recused if there's no other judge who is unconflicted to take his place. Every judge in the state of Alaska gets money from the oil trust fund every year. So a challenge to it, they have to hear it because they all get the money. What they don't realize is, well, who would hear it? Now they say, well, uh, 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 because he might have want, want to marry his same-sex partner, he has an interest in it. But all the other judges that could hear it are either also gay or they're straight. And under their theory, their marriages are severely harmed by same-sex marriage. They don't seem to recognize it. Well, and, and of course, they don't even think about the fact that if their theory of the case is right, the straight judges are conflicted too because their marriages are going to be harmed if, if uh, Prop 8 is struck down. It just seems to be a just glaring inconsistency that shows that they don't actually <laughs> believe that it, it, it's other people's happiness that they're about. It's not about the, the injury. And that, to me, is the most revealing aspect of, uh, uh, of the fault line in their arguments. Perhaps we could call it one of the last gasps of a dying argument. <laughs> I want to thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks to ACS for putting together the program and to Microsoft for hosting, and we'll look forward to seeing what happens. <laughs>